It is good to see you here this morning. Let's begin our service with prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the chance to gather together today. And Lord, we thank you for the beautiful fall that you've given us. It's rainy right now, but Lord, we thank you for the, the beautiful leaves that we've been able to see and just your handiwork in creation. And we praise you for that. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with us today as we worship you, that we can focus in on the truth that you have for us, that we can learn of you. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to just lift you up and to praise you. We ask this in your name. Amen. We have just a, a few announcements today. The, there are more announcements in the little bulletin sheet. They're out on the table in Jewel Hall. Feel free to grab one on your way out if you didn't get one on the way in. Um, and then also we want to encourage you to stick around for Sunday school. That will be at 11 o'clock this, uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, next Sunday, our, one of the missionaries that we support, David Clemente, will be here and he'll be speaking. And so we encourage you to come back, find out a little bit more about what God is doing in our Asian work. And then again, um, the month of October is our food drive month and we are helping our brother's keeper down in Big Rapids. So we encourage you to bring in your donations for that. It can be cash donations. It can be different products that are needed. And if you're bringing in the different products, the, the tables are set up here in Jewel Hall and you can put them on your country bumpkin side or the city slicker side. So let's stand together as we sing our Lord's praises.
with us. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, and there we find, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and in holiness. today we do thank you for your your amazing love to us lord i thank you for the way that you continue to speak to us we celebrate what you did for us on the cross two thousand years ago and lord that that is truly marvelous beyond description but lord i thank you for the way that you continue to work in our lives for the way that you continue to speak to us lord i thank you for these songs that we sing and as they talk about the way that you are with us and the difference that you have made in our lives and lord I just praise you for the way that you are with us each and every day and you work in our lives and for the miracles that we have seen even just this past week. Lord, we thank you for the way that you are working in the lives of those who are physically struggling. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to be with them. I pray that you'll bring healing and I pray that you'll, your strength and your peace will just fill each heart. And Lord, I just I thank you for the privilege of knowing you as my Lord. And I pray that you will help each of us here today to share that, that joy, that privilege with those around us. 
that they may also come to know you. We ask this in your name. Amen. As is our new norm, um, we will be taking up the offering on the way out. If you came prepared for Mission Sunday, um, that offering will actually be taken up next week when our missionary, uh, David Clemente, is here. So um, sorry I didn't get word out to you earlier, but if you could just bring that back next week, that would be great. We'll just be having our regular budget offering, and that will be as you exit uh, the sanctuary. The theme that we're working on for messages uh, for the near future, at least, is that, but then Jesus came. And thinking of the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. And you look in the scripture, there are so many stories of the difference that Jesus makes. And then in my own life, I know the difference that Jesus made. And I hear the stories in our church. We have a lot of wonderful stories in our church of the difference that Jesus has made. And I get to hear some of these stories, but a lot of you don't. And so what I've started doing is asking a few of you to share. And um, today, Skip is going to be sharing his testimony. Uh, he's going to be taking up uh, the, the rest of the service. Um, we've got a couple lined up for November and December. They'll be taking five to 10 minutes sharing their testimony. And um, some of you, 
I'll be asking you a little later. So, you know, get ready. Um, but it, <laughs> God speaks to all of us in different ways that communicate exactly what we need to hear at that time. And I just want to be able to share some of those stories of how he has met our needs, how he's changed our lives. And I heard Skip's story, um, at least parts of it, a couple different times. And I thought, that's a message we need to hear. So Skip, if you would come and share. Morning. My name is Skip, and I am an alcoholic. And only by God's grace can I say that I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. So let me tell you how that came about. Um, I was born into a Christian family, my mom and dad. Um, we belonged to the United Methodist Church. And uh, my mom was real involved in the church, sang in a choir, always, you know how the ladies are. Um, <laughs> uh, but my dad, he was kind of, he was there every Sunday. And uh, my job as a child in church was to keep him awake. And uh, that was kind of... Uh, um, that was my background upbringing. But I, I did like to say that I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church. I got drugged to Sunday school. I got <laughs> drugged to vacation Bible school. I got drugged to Wednesday night meetings. I got, uh, one time I got drugged out of bed and said, get dressed, we're going. <laughs> so uh, that only happened one time. <clears throat> I learned after that. Um, but, but the thing about that is that I knew, um, I had a basis or background in my life. I knew where to turn when I needed help. Even though I did not have a very strong relationship with God, um, I knew where to find him when I needed him. And uh, that came many years later. But in, in the meantime, um, you know, I was one of those uh, uh, lucky people. And right before, I was about 16 years old when they lowered a drinking age to 18. So, you know, I had a little bit of fur on my chin and I could pretty much convince any party store I went into that I was old enough and I could buy beer anytime I wanted. So that, uh, that got me started and uh, probably in retrospect, I had a problem from a very early age. Um, when, uh, um, you know, when, when I was in high school, uh, I had a car, I would, uh, you know, I could stop at the at the local A and P and pick up a case of beer on the way to school. And anybody who felt like skipping school, I had a good buddy that uh, his brother owned a house on a lake and he had a boat. And you know, wouldn't you rather go fishing or than than to go to school? So, well, that's what we did. So, uh, um, I got to be my senior year, and it, I was so far behind because I'd m missed so much school. I just decided it would be better if. Um, I went and got a job somewhere, and uh, my counselor asked my dad, she said, uh, can you give him a job, you know? And uh, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I work in a heat treat, I will put him to work, and he will be back next year <laughs> begging to get back into school. Well, that never happened, because uh, in the meantime, my girlfriend uh, got pregnant, and we decided to get married and start a family instead, so... Now we're off. Uh, so we were married at 18 and bought a little house in Detroit and uh, started raising our family there. And um, my drinking had slowed down some just because there was no money for that, you know. And uh, there was another human adult in the house with me saying, you know, we can't do that. You know, it's too much money, too much money. So, so that kind of slowed down. And then... Uh, that marriage lasted for about 15 years, and then uh, we decided to go separate ways. And uh, there was an interim time, and that's kind of where the drinking really picked up, you know. Uh, 1991, um, uh, I met my current wife, or I married Marilyn. Marilyn and I were married. We, 
we put our families together and uh, bought a house in Ortonville, and we lived there for 25 years, and it was a good place to live. But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't the kind of drunk that um, got drunk every night. Um, occasionally, I didn't even have to have something to drink every day. But my problem was that once I started going, I didn't really know how it was going to end. I couldn't predict if it was, if it was going to be two drinks and gone. You know, I worked in Wixom, 30 miles from home, got off work. I'm still working in a heat treat, okay? Um, but it was hot working in heat treat, and uh, we, we would take and uh, um, uh, stop for, you know, the crew would stop for a few beers after work, and most of them would go home, and then, of course, well, as things progressed with the alcoholism, uh, because it is a progressive disease, um, I just, I got worse and worse, and when they went home, I would stay, you know. So, <clears throat> 2007 in July was the first time I was arrested for drunk driving. Now, uh, that day at work had been a very hot day in July, hot and humid, we were working up at the ceiling, running some water pipes, and I was up there, and I was dehydrated, Lunchtime, I didn't eat anything. I didn't feel like it. So after work, of course, off we go to the bar, and we're getting our 16-ounce uh, draft beers for a buck. You know, such a deal. So uh, that night I got stopped right before I got home. And, uh, and that was 2007, and I had a, a, a real good um, forgetter. I could forget things, you know, because... Before that happened, you know, I knew I kind of had a problem. Um, you know, I'd ding up a car, or a truck on the way home, you know, get too close to the trees. Living on these dirt roads in Oakland County, they grow these trees right on the edge of the road, you know. I don't get it, but it's... Uh, so, I, uh, so I knew I had a problem, but I didn't, I didn't do anything to address it, and... Um, During, uh, oh, uh, like I was saying, I, I have a good forgetter. So once I would get out of trouble with that, say, you know, because my wife's mad at me, I wrecked a car. You know, I got to pay to get it fixed. I can't go you know, to the insurance company. So, um, you know, I'd behave myself for two or three weeks, a month or something like that. But then I'd gradually get right back into the same routine. And, uh, <clears throat> and that same routine, because all these things had happened prior to my arrest at work, None of this was my fault, I know. I, even though it had happened a lot before. Um, but, you know, I just had, I was denying it, you know. Um, I went on the Alcoholic Anonymous website once or twice, you know, just to kind of see what it was about. And, you know, I knew one guy um, at work, and he was an older guy, and he was in AA for a long time. And he was the meanest cuss you ever wanted to meet. <laughs> And I just thought, if that's what AA does for you, I don't want any part of that. So, so between 2007 and 2010, um, I just, with the progression of the disease, and now the kids are all gone, Marilyn's working nights, um, you know, I would come home from work. First of all, I would stop after work with the guys and I would drink, and then I would buy some for the ride home. And then when I got home, I'd grab, I used to have a little wiener dog named Dewey, and we'd jump in the truck and we'd go running the back roads. And uh, somewhere in there, I just, I quit caring about anything or anybody, you know. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I just, I had a soul sickness. You know, I just, I didn't have any relationship with God. I didn't have anything going. And it just, uh, I didn't really want to be like that. You know, I, you know, I'm, I try to be a law-abiding citizen. I, you know, I try to, um, you know, I try to, I just felt out of sorts. You know, I didn't feel right. Something was missing in my life, something big. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I'd said lots of prayers in there, like, God, get me out of this. I'll never do it again. But that's all it was, really. It was just lip service. 
So by October the 14th, 2010, um, I had been, uh, this company that I worked for, if you all recall, 2009 was a pretty crummy year. Um, and the um, economy was down and, and the fellow that owned the company I worked for, he owned two heat treating companies and he closed one down and then he took that management over to where I worked and they took over in charge there. So I was kind of demoted. I kind of had another person I had to answer to, which I didn't like. And, and, uh, and then in 2010, things picked up. They wanted to reopen this plant. So that was my job is to get the plant open, running, the equipment running again. Well, when they left, they just turned the lights off and left, locked the door. I mean, uh, we turned on the water and there's busted pipes everywhere. And it, it was just a mess. So we had about a five-man crew working on that. And it took us about a month to get, before things, we started gaining on it, you know, and the equipment was up and running. And we just had, uh, um, we're going to celebrate, right? So we celebrate. We go down to the bar, and son of a gun, if they don't have red 16-ounce red Solo cup beers for a dollar, you know, such a deal. So we had quite a few that night, and this was October the 14th of 2010. And uh, I remember driving home, and it was about a 40-mile ride, and uh, it was dark, it was rainy, it was um, a lot of construction, hard to see, um, and I'm just beside myself. I'm, I'm so upset because I drank that much, and I... And I had to get home, and I just, so when I pulled in the driveway, finally I got there. I think I've said my first real prayer in my life, you know. And, and I asked God, I says, you know, please, please take this away from me. I can't do it on my own. I just can't do it. And then I made my fatal error. I said, whatever it takes. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> when you pray for something, you and you're serious about it, watch out. So the very next day, October 15th, 2010, um, I'm back at work, and this time I packed a bag and I was going to stay in a hotel about a mile from the shop. And uh, things were going good again, so right there I am, right back there, right back in this insanity. And uh, that's part of alcoholism. You keep doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different outcome. And it just doesn't work. Um, so on the 15th, I think I had two beers that I remember, and I don't remember anything after that. I don't remember leaving the bar. I don't remember driving past the plant half a mile away. I don't remember passing by the hotel where I had a reservation one mile away. And I don't remember 25 miles away and I'm over, I'd gone as far as I could um, east to Lake St. Clair and I couldn't go any farther. So I'm on Jefferson and I'm driving south and I came, uh, I came up to a flashing yellow light and I stopped there and I, and I passed right out, just passed out. Right outside of the Gross Point Shores Police Department. <laughs> and they've got a great big window out there and they're watching me and they're looking at me and I think we ought to send somebody out there to check this guy out. So October the 15th, uh, that is my sobriety date, 2010. So I just passed my 10 year anniversary uh, Thursday. So now the, uh, um, I hired an attorney there because now this is my second drunk driving charge and things get pretty serious, um, especially with the state because you automatically lose your driver's license for a year. At, at that time, that was just, that was it. No questions, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how important I was, it didn't matter. You know, I had a family to feed, it didn't matter. They don't care. So. I hired an attorney there, and uh, so the first miracle about, about this whole deal, the first time I saw Jesus in this was he took me to exactly the right little municipality because I'd passed through a lot of them that are very, very hard on drunk drivers. Some of them you're getting 30 days, first offense, and this was my second. 
So um, Gross Point Shores is a two square mile little community right there on Lake St. Clair. And the judge there is a part-time judge. And when he's not being a judge, he's a uh, defense attorney. So he was a pretty good guy, you know. If I'd had one that was a part-time prosecutor, it would have been a different story. But, but uh, so God set this up for me, and he, he steered me towards a uh, uh, towards an, an attorney uh, local. And as it turns out, he knew the judge; they were buddies. And um, he says, "You know, I'm not just your attorney; I'm your counselor too." And he says. I think you should go to AA. He says, I really think you need to, by what you told me and everything that happened, you were in a blackout and you were driving and you don't remember anything. He says, you should probably go to AA. So I, I agreed. And this was, uh, let's see, it was a Friday night, I think, when I got arrested. So Monday morning, I talked to the attorney. Monday night, I went to my first AA meeting. And it was a... It was a men's meeting. It was in Clarkston, and it was called the Monday Night Misfits. And uh, uh, wow, what a bunch of guys! I walked in there, and I'm just—I'm a train wreck. I thought my life was over. I thought I was—I thought I was going to lose my job. I thought I was going to lose my house. I thought I was going to lose my wife, my family, everything. I thought—I thought it was over. I thought it was done. I didn't really see any reason to—to to keep going. And then, uh, and then they, uh, you know, the four hardest words I ever had to say out loud was, I am an alcoholic, because that meant I had to do something about it. <laughs> and uh, if, yeah, I could say it in my head, I could say it, but I couldn't say it out loud, not even by myself, you know. But once I said it out loud, then I had to do something about it. And then once I said it in front of a group of guys, I really had to do something about it. And uh, they gave me some very good advice then. They said, if you stop doing what you're doing, your life will get better. But if you don't stop doing what you're doing, your life is going to get worse. And that's all there is to it. And they were so right. I found that that's exactly the place I needed to be at that time. I didn't have a relationship with God because my brain was so fogged over with alcohol. I just couldn't, I couldn't get there until that went away. Uh, then I could then I could get that relationship back. So the night I woke up in jail, um, backtrack a little bit, but this is such a fancy jail, um, didn't even have bars, had plexiglass. So I'm scratching my head, looking around, I'm all by myself in this plexiglass room. I don't know where I am or what I'm doing there, you know. And then, uh, you know, it dawned on me then that you can't open the door and... It's pretty heavy plexiglass, glass, and there's a big stainless steel toilet in the corner. So I figured that out then. Um, and then uh, that was probably my second real good prayer there. Um, again, just asking God to, to, to help me with this and to do, you know, do what I couldn't do by myself at all. Um, and uh, I just felt like this great big bear hug around me, you know. Uh, who's in here with me? You know? And there's nobody there. Uh, and, but but I, felt, uh, I felt the peaceful, I felt the serenity, I felt the relaxed. And I, and I just felt like, okay, it's over and I can start afresh now. It's over. And, uh, and I know God was with me that night. <clears throat> So anyway, um, now I get up to, that's mid-October now. I'm waiting for, for my letter from the state, you know, telling me to stop driving. And, you know, well, of course, it comes on Christmas Eve. So right during Christmas Eve, uh, that was my Christmas present. Cease and desist all driving uh, right now until further notice, basically. So the thing is, you have to, you have, to have, you can't drive and, and you have to have a year of no driving before you can apply to get it back, which can take another six months. In my case, it did. So, you know, so now I didn't really know what to do, but I had a few days to think about it because I think I was off work for the rest of the year. And I recall a neighbor of mine when we'd first moved in a couple of years earlier, 
had said that he worked in Lixon too. So I, I wonder if he still works in Lixon. So I walked down and I talked to this neighbor. And uh, he said, yeah, I, said, I work about two miles from where you work. So he says, if you're at the end of my driveway at 5.30 in the morning, um, hop in and I'll take you to, you know, I'll take you to where I work. And then uh, a fellow that I worked with would stop there, pick me up, take me the other two miles. And if he was not there for some reason, two miles was easy to walk, you know. So, um, and then on the way home, I could drive halfway home with a guy that I worked with. And then I would start walking from there. And when Marilyn got off work, she would kind of, she knew what route I was going to take. So she'd drive that route until she found me and could pick me up and bring me home. It's kind of like, where's Waldo, you know? So that's how that worked out. But, you know, what a miracle, because I thought, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. Do I quit my job? That doesn't help anything. So, you know, would I have to rent an apartment in town so I could walk to and from? That's probably what I would have had to have done. But, you know, God had other, other ideas for me. So all this, while I'm the president of the men's club at the United Methodist Church in Ortonville. And, you know, one of, the, one of the hardest things I had to do was stand up in front of them and say, guys, I let you down. I, this is what I did, you know. And they could have said a lot of things, but they didn't. They, they prayed for me. Right then and there. They just, they gathered around me, put hands on me. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful thing, I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> so now comes July, and it's hot again. And I'm walking to an AA meeting, and it's a couple miles from, from the house. And I'm driving down this hot, dusty, dirty dirt road and cars are flying by and pickup trucks are flying by throwing empty cans at, beer cans at me, you know, laughing. And I'm sweating and this dust is sticking to me and I'm 55 years old and I said, God, what is this about? Why? <laughs> Why? I was just, I was beside myself. So, As I'm walking, I see this, this kid sitting at a table there and selling uh, lemonade. Well, I like to, you know, I like to buy lemonade from kids at their stands, so I, I stopped here. And as I approach this table, I see this little girl. And she's not sitting in a chair, she's sitting in a wheelchair. And she's selling, <laughs> she's selling lemonade in red solo cups. <laughs> I couldn't even speak. I couldn't talk. I couldn't ask her. I, I couldn't say anything. I just, I gave her the money. I took the cup and I kept walking, you know. So the next week at, uh, at church, I knew the woman lived right next door to this little girl. And I asked her about, she says, no, there's nobody that lives there <laughs> like that. And uh, I says, well, who was selling lemonade? Nobody. We didn't. And I didn't see anybody out there selling lemonade. So... You know, I'm sure that God puts angels in your path just for, just for these times. <clears throat> so, right about the time, so, you know, as time went on, I, I wound up getting my license back. And I just, I just prayed and I asked God, I said, whoever needs a ride, let me be able to give them a ride. Because I got a lot of rides when I was walking and... And you get around AA meetings, there's a lot of people that can't drive, and they need ways to get there. And uh, one day I was, I was going to this AA meeting. It was, it was a nice day, and I thought, well, God, put somebody in my life today that I can help. You know, how's that? Somebody that I can help. So at this point, we had bought a house up here, and Marilyn was living up here, and I was selling a house down there. So the house is pretty well cleared out, you know. I've just got my stuff, and that's, that's it. And uh, so I walk into this AA meeting, and there was a guy, and I'd seen him once before, I thought. And he was this young kid, but big, big strapping kid, you know. 
And he's just crying outside of this, waiting to go inside, you know. I said, man, what's wrong? <laughs> and he told me, he says, uh, you know, I got arrested. My wife and I were having a fight, and we'd both been drinking. And, the, and one of the kids called 911. And when 911 comes, somebody's going to jail. Somebody's going to jail. So they took him to jail. And then uh, the judge told him that, uh, um, I think it was 30 days. You can't go home for 30 days. You're not allowed anywhere around that house. And he's just, he didn't know what to do. He had been living with a friend of his for a couple of, for a, just a few days, I think. And, and this, uh, this friend was kicking him out. He said, uh, you know, you can't stay here anymore. And I said, well, my friend, I think this happened just to fulfill what I was praying about today. <laughs> because I've got a house, an empty house, five-bedroom house that's empty. And I'm using one bedroom on it. And it's going to be around for another 30 days. So come and stay there. And what a blessing that turned out to be. Him and I became pretty good friends. And his wife would sneak over and kids would sneak over and see him. You know, on weekends when I would come up here, his wife and kids would sneak over there and see him. He wasn't allowed near the house, but they could go by him. So anyway, um, so, you know, once I, once I really turned this over to, to God, you know, it, 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 from the very start, it was just feeling better and better and better. Um, you know, and, and that night, or shortly after that, I'd ask God for some kind of a sign, you know, that it was really him. Because once I, once I got out of jail the second time, I, uh, I asked for a sign. He didn't give me a sign. <laughs> I, says, I just want to know that it's you, you know. Nope, no sign. So a week or two later, I'm going, I'm doing one of these things. I go, how? Wow, I got fingernails. Where'd those come from? I used to chew these things right down to the nub, you know, right down to the blood. Just chewed them all the time because I was nervous. I was scared. I was, you know, is there a cop coming? Is there not coming? Is there, you know. And, uh, and some of you know this about me, but maybe all of you don't, is my son is a police officer. He's married to a police officer. My daughter is married to an Oakland County Sheriff deputy, and she works for Oakland County uh, Sheriff's Department. So I get arrested in Oakland County. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's terrible. Anyway, um, I do, uh, you know, one thing they teach us in AA is to, to fill a toolbox full of tools that we can use so that when, uh, when things are down or things are rough, we know what to do. And, um, I have support groups in AA, and uh, my family is a wonderful support group. My wife, um, can't believe she put up with me all those years. Um, church and uh, an accountability group kind of through Keurigs. And I don't know if any of you, uh, many of you have been to Keurigs. If you have not, it's really a wonderful program. And if you want to see the Holy Spirit at work, that's a great place to see it. Because... Uh, it just gets a hold of you, you know. Um, and I just want to close out with, with this. I, was, uh, I just found this this morning. In an AMA meeting, <clears throat> pardon me, um, they're pretty much all run the same way. Uh, if you get into an Indian reservation or maybe over uh, in countries that are not Christian countries, they may run them a little different. But here in the United States, they, they start out with a serenity prayer. And I'm going to read that. And then... We sit around for an hour and we talk about how God's working in our lives. And then we close with the Lord's Prayer. So the serenity prayer that we read <clears throat> goes like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can, which is me, you know. And the wisdom to know the difference. That's where we stop. But there's more to that, that prayer and this is the rest of it. It says, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking, as he did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. 
that, a, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next life. Amen. Thank you. We have some good stories of what God has done in our church. Um, and that's one of them. I asked Skip uh, a while ago if he'd be willing to, sp to bring his testimony. And I asked him if he'd do it last Sunday. And he said, boy, could I wait another week? Because that would be just after the 10-year anniversary. Um, and he mentioned, I think it was at the Curix group. He says, 10 years sober, it's the best 10 years of my life. When Jesus comes... There's a difference. Let's stand together for prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for the difference that you make when you come into our lives. Lord, I thank you for the way that you speak to us in ways that communicate to our hearts the things that, that we need to hear. You tailor the message just to us. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for your amazing love. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to, each of us to open our hearts and our minds and our lives to you. Lord, may you fill us with your power, with your love, with your forgiveness. And Lord, may you change us from the inside out. We ask this in your name. Amen.